You're listening to Body Banter, a podcast where we have conversations about the human body in all its forms and from as many perspectives we can find. We are your hosts, Shagoya Dile and Claudia Krebs. And we are professors of anatomy in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Anatomy is for everybody and every body. And we're here to get the body banter going. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Body Banter. My name is Claudia Krebs, and I am joining you from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, also known as Vancouver, Canada. And I'm joined, of course, by Shegan, our co-host here. Hi, everyone. My name is Shegun Yedele. I am joining you from Kelowna in the traditional unceded territories of the Silks Okanagan peoples. And we have a very special guest today. And uh, I'll allow you to introduce yourself, Laurie. Go ahead. Sure thing. My name is Laurie Brado, um, and I am also coming from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and want to give great thanks to those ancestral peoples for really allowing me to do the work that I do in sexual health on these lands and excited about this conversation. Well, we're excited to have you and a little bit starstruck. You are an absolute superstar when it comes to sexual health. You've published a book. You are behind a Netflix series about pleasure uh, and sex. And um, it's great to have you here. Tell me how you got involved in this line of work. Okay. Uh, Well, um, totally by accident. And uh, although I like to I like to credit serendipity um, and this might lead us into some of the conversation around sex education and its limits, um, because I didn't have sex education in my own school. And in fact, any discussions about sexuality in my own home growing up were um, quite negative. They were very much from the perspective of sex is bad, sex is dangerous, don't do it, people will know, people will know even if you're thinking about it. And so really, um, up until I began my undergraduate studies, um, I had no sex ed, and certainly no intention of ever becoming a professor of sex research. Um, But it was really through volunteering in a lab that, um, first of all, reified my love of science and research and the scientific method. Um, And it just so happened that those early volunteer experiences happened to be in a lab that was focused on uh, looking at animal models of sexual problems. So I spent six years looking at the effects of antidepressants and stress and housing conditions on mounting behavior of male rats um, and learned a lot about the impact, uh, again, not only of medications, but really of these social factors that directly contributed into whether rats engaged in sex and how receptive and and proceptive that they were. Um, And so uh, I say by accident, because I certainly didn't set out to gain that experience, but in the process of those six years, fell in love also with um, this really complex phenomenon. I mean, I can't think of really many other experiences that fold in every organ system that is cut across every social determinant that is impacted by relationships um, and culture. Um, and uh, so so um, I am certainly now in it by choice, um, but happy serendipity is really what got me to this place. That's such a great story of um, kind of finding your niche and, and really the place you needed to be um, through serendipity as you put it I like that that's that's really wonderful let's talk about sex ed um it's it's not great right Mm -hmm. and I think it's gotten better I'll share my story I'll set the scene it's 1984 I'm in fourth grade and I'm in Kansas and it's about as awkward as this setting of the scene makes it I remember the day it was a sunny day it was a spring it was beautiful it was warm I was outside playing American football with the boys because my teacher was really 
uh, very inclusive. And it used to be like very gendered. Only the boys would play football. And he's like, Claudia, come on, join us. You know, it looks like you'll have fun with this. And I did. And I had fun. And then I was pulled out of the game because all of the girls had to go inside. The boys were allowed to continue playing football Mm -hmm. because the sex ed was now going to be segregated, boys and girls separately. And so I remember having to walk back into the classroom and the school nurse was there. She was visibly uncomfortable. You know, she had probably had to do this every year for the fourth grade class. And she probably dreaded this day. And that's at least what it looked like. She was, her body language was stiff and uncomfortable. And she told us that we would start bleeding. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what is happening? And, um, and that, you know, th- this would be our period and it would come every month. And um, I don't remember much of it other than the awkwardness of it and this revelation that we would start bleeding. And then she told us that we could put tampons into our vagina and that there was a string attached and sometimes the string would rip and then we'd have to go in and retrieve the tampon with our fingers. That's what I remember from my sex ed class. Mm -hmm. It was so weird. Mm -hmm. And I was so confused. I was like, what, what was this and why the string? Like, that was my big question. And then we were given a pamphlet from some sex ed, I don't know, something um, to take home. And I remember I walked home from school with my friend Jennifer. And of course, we were looking through this pamphlet, which was also extremely poorly written. There was really no explanation of what puberty really was and menstruation or sex. Um, but it did say that when you got your period, you might also get diarrhea. Those were the things that kind of stuck with me. So um, that was a pretty poor experience. Now, I grew up in a very um, open and um, uh, household where, you know, we could talk about these things. So I talked about with my parents who cleared up all misconceptions and got me some really good literature to read. And it was fine. But the school experience was pretty sad. Mm-hmm. Shagan, how about you? How was your right. experience? So, I mean... When we're, I mean, if we're sharing stories and maybe <laughs> rating them, mine's really worse than that in the sense that uh, this was late 70s um, in Africa, Nigeria to be specific. Um, and so, and I, this was a Catholic school, school boys only. And so um, it was, there was no formal sex ed class. Um, it was just, uh, everything was learned by rumors and innuendos and things that happen in the dark that you never talk about and people were given names um, and, and kind of by the by the kind of name that the boys called them you know oh this person probably um, is um, you know is not um, a cisgendered uh, male and 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 so you were kind of looking at them suspiciously and they were ostracized and so it was it was it was horrible and um and at home it was not it was not better because this was my my parents were super super conservative this was an african traditional family you just don't talk about those things i remember very vividly this today i i i laugh but um so after after school, we would go to like a like a um, a diff, like a um, it was a separate homework group, uh, but it was supervised by a teacher from the school who who did that as something she did uh, um, like almost babysitting, but at the same time just making sure that we were learning at the same time. And I made a sexual comment, <laughs> a sexual joke, <laughs> and everybody. The room froze and the teacher said, what happened? What just happened? And I was dragged to the front of the class and shamed. And I'm going to tell your mother. (laughs) That was one of the worst days of my life. And I I remember sobbing and and screaming, please don't. I'm going to be killed. (laughs) Wow. Yeah, so um, it was that kind of experience, that kind of background, and it, it. So yeah, it was not healthy. There was no formal, sensitive, healthy way of breaking boys or even girls, for that matter, into into that into this topic of sex. And and yeah, 
over the years, of course, now that I've had my own kids, um, you can imagine that I struggled. I struggled with, <laughs> I struggled with having those conversations with them, and I've I have had to, because obviously, you know, I you know, catching them at some inappropriate moments, you know, watching some porn or things like that. And I'd have had to have a conversation, but yeah, it was, it was, it was awkward to say the least. So, yeah. So that's my story. And uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm really happy about this podcast because I'm, I think I'm, I'm going to learn a lot of things <laughs> from all of you, from Laurie especially. But uh, yeah, so for me, it's been a work in progress, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So Laurie, this, is this typical sort of innuendo, shame-based yeah. sex ed approach? You know, it's interesting as I'm, as I'm listening to the two of you share your stories and mine was... Um, really absent sex education um, at school, none of it at school. And at home, it was a, a mixture of um, shame-based, don't go there. And we just don't talk about those things. And it's making me think about, you know, which is worse. And I, I actually think both of them are extremely harmful because in the absence of good, accurate, empowering, evidence-based, up-to-date information, people are really left to... Um, using, let's say, pornography, which is so accessible. Any of us could pick up our smartphone and have access to pornography within 10 seconds. Um, and we do know that that is a source of, you know, I'm using air quotes, even though I know your listeners can't see my air quotes, um, sex education for a lot of young people. They sort of study and watch these uh, scenes and a lot of their understanding about sex and bodies and communication and consent comes from what they, what they see from this. Um, the other thing that really strikes me in hearing both of your stories is, I mean, both of you are describing experiences from 35, 40 years ago and you can still recall them with such vivid clarity, where you were, what the teacher looked like, how you felt in the moment, um, what you were pulled away from. And it, it really highlights that um, information about sexuality, it's not just pure information, it's wrapped up in emotions and beliefs about ourselves. Uh, and so the early learning that we have, whether it's absent or um, quite negative, can very much stay with us for the rest of our life and impact how we think about sex, how we talk to partners, even when we get really good information, right? You, so you sort of have this conflict as you grow up, you're exposed um, to better information, at least accurate information, and yet you still have the, the lived experience of feeling shame, feeling bad, feeling stigmatized. And for some people, they can't unpack those. Uh, they, th those feelings kind of follow them into their own sex lives. So the bottom line, good sex education is, is foundational. It's never too late to get it. Um, in my case, I got it in my, you know, 20s by virtue of doing the research that I was doing. Um, but everyone needs sex education, good sex education at some point. Yeah, Laurie, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the anecdote about the school nurse is really funny in my biography. Um, and I remember it because it was so awkward more than anything mm -hmm. else. And I really <laughs> want to credit my parents for being really loving and good sex educators in that uh -huh. way and being very sort of affirming and open and um there was there was no taboo it was very um normal I guess uh, so it was a very positive experience at home I really want to credit my parents here on this podcast for being awesome in that in many regards including that one go awesome parents <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So when we talk about um, sex and when we talk about the anatomy of sex, um, we've already used words to describe our experiences that had the words shame associated with it, awkwardness and all of that. And that seems to be a recurrent theme because when we look at some of the words that are given to genitalia, they're still from the Latin roots that um, imply shame. Um, we don't use pudendum anymore um, for 
uh, sort of the female genital areas, but we still call the nerve that innervates that entire area, including the penis and the clitoris, the pudendal nerve. And pudendum, of course, means shame. Um, and so it's very ingrained in there. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this sort of nomenclature and the language that we use around the anatomy of our genitalia? Yeah, it's longstanding. And although things are starting to shift, um, I think the legacy of um, historically how we used to, like I'll, I'll, I'll talk from the perspective of female sexuality specifically, um, where, you know, thank you Freud in the late 1800s, essentially um, set up a number of theories that have been not only disproven, but they but they have had this long standing impact on how we think about sexuality. So, for example, women were classified as either nymphomaniac if they wanted sex too much, or frigid, i.e., cold, um, if they didn't want sex at all. And those two diagnoses remained in effect until about 1980. So, though, which was not that long ago. I remember 1980. <laughs> I remember what I was doing in 1980. Um, and uh, so there is this kind of legacy that, you know, continues to this day around, oh, okay, we are either, uh, want, we either want sex too much or not enough and, and we're cold as opposed to recognizing all of the nuance in between. Um, the same holds when it comes to clitoral anatomy. And interestingly, it was Freud himself who, um, developed his theory of sexual development, which essentially stated that if women achieved orgasm through clitoral stimulation, this was a sign of immature development um, and that they couldn't actually go on to develop healthy, adult, normal, quote, normal sexuality, which entailed vaginal orgasms. Um, and, and that theory, which predominated a lot of the um, teaching in psychology and psychiatry and also in medicine, then cast this layer of darkness around female genital anatomy and in the clitoris in particular, to the point where um, it was, you know, really not talked about, not described in anatomy, to anatomy textbooks, and certainly in the context of women's sexuality and pleasure. It's really only been very recently that we've talked about the importance of clitoral anatomy, uh, not just what is visibly visible on the external surface, but much more importantly, what is not visible below the surface of the skin and the extensive innervation of the, uh, the clitoral bulbs, et cetera. Um, and most people just don't know that, right? They, have, they, have, they just have no idea that this is the case. So we have a long way to go in anatomy. When I speak to my uh, surgeon colleagues who are down the hall that operate on gynecologic cancer survivors, they continue to tell me to this day that they can't guarantee that some of those important nerve pathways involved in women's uh, pleasure are preserved. Um, by contrast, we do have radical prostatectomy where some of those nerves can be identified and spared and sort of moved out of the way during surgeries. So um, just the, it's a much bigger question around kind of our understanding of female, uh, female bodies and female anatomy. We know that up until the year 2000, females were not traditionally regularly included in clinical trials. Um, crash test dummies, as one example, were built based on male bodies. And, and so we have a lot of catch up to do around equity in uh, gender, sex and gender based research. And of course, that directly affects our understanding of female body anatomy and, and what that means for sexual pleasure. So I know I've just said a lot. The bottom line is that there's so I think there's so much more that we don't know than we do actually know, including where is pleasure? What is pleasure? Where is it? How do we get it? We know that when pleasure is um, not satisfactory, that that can be a major cause of disruption to relationships, personal distress. It's why people stop using their medications if there's been an impact on sexual pleasure. But where pleasure is exactly in the brain and body, we actually still don't know that. Right. And, and, and thanks for for saying that, you know, maybe to bring you back a little bit to to the uh, terminology, 
because I remember from, from your series, which I encourage all our listeners to absolutely go and watch, um, the one of the questions to one of the participants about um, how they would talk about their vulva, and this person reeled off like te- five, six different pseudonyms or alternative names by which they would they would um, describe the anatomy and and um and i'm wondering where where i mean in, in popular culture it's something similar is happening you know so that where the traditional anatomists use these names that are shaming that are uh, that are you know really derogatory to describe you know the female anatomy you find that even in popular culture we do the same thing <laughs> we uh, replicate those same terms uh, just using maybe more modern sl- slangs and and i'm and i'm asking about the the link between that you know is that all a- again out of the fact that sex ed is lacking or that traditionally people have really been ashamed to talk about this and maybe what what's the way forward you know what what can we and i'm looking at myself as as the guy here in this conversation mm-hmm. what what role do the do the guys have um, to, because I know, I, I absolutely know, you know, among the guys when they, they alone, the so-called I don't know, I don't know, um, locker, the private locker mm-hmm. talk, you know, and, and all, all the terms come out. So, so I'm wondering in, in, in creating a new way and a new path, a more healthy way forward, mm-hmm. how, do we, how do we begin to make a difference? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you stated the answer in your question when you said, does it have like, does it come back to good sex education and good sex education includes uh, an accurate description of anatomy. And that is not the case in all parts of Canada. Um, As one example, uh, you know, years ago the Ontario sex education program in elementary schools was much, much better in terms of describing genital anatomy, um, including the very specific different parts of genital anatomy for both female bodied and male bodied people. And then that changed about five or six years ago because of public outcry and concern that teaching kids, you know, teaching six year old kids what a clitoris was, Uh, or what the labia were, or what the scrotum was, might lead them to become sexually promiscuous. And that language is still used to this day, right? This idea. So the hypothesis is that by teaching kids proper names, they're suddenly, you know, going to be unleashed, unhinged, and they're going to be having all of this unprotected sex. And you can see just how the the kind of fear-mongering nature of that hypothesis. First of all, it's totally unproven, Totally the opposite unproven. is true, isn't it? The opposite is true. Okay. We, yeah. yeah, and we could look to the literature on, you know, what happens when we put condom machines in school. There was a similar fear-mongering concern. Suddenly, everyone's going to be having sex in bathrooms. No, actually putting condoms in schools reduced the risk, uh, reduced the rates, not just of unintended pregnancy, but engaging in sexual activity in general because it went along with good sex education. So we absolutely need to be teaching children at the youngest possible age the proper genital anatomy terms of their body of other bodied people we need to normalize it um we we also there are data indicating that kids that don't have that are less likely to report a sexual abuse that has happened to them compared to the kids that do, that were taught the proper names of their own genitals. I mean, one of the things that really, I think one of the biggest things that struck me from uh, the Netflix series on principles of pleasure, uh, the number of people that I know in my own life that have said to me, oh my gosh, I didn't know that the entire area was called a vulva. I've always been calling it a vagina. And again, so we just sort of see the legacy of that lack of information. Um, And then somewhere along the line, it's almost as if the terms themselves have been wrapped up in shame and, you know, dirtiness and secrecy when really, I mean, they're just a part of the anatomy in the same way that the elbow is or the, you know, cartilage in your nose is. 
Um, and so what is it about those particular structures that have, have married them to shame and, and secrecy? That I don't know, but it's time we stop. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. And of course, my kids growing up in an anatomist's household, you know, I've always used all the the correct words. I never used like substitutes for their anatomy. And so I remember once I was taking um, my son to a, like a well child checkup, like whatever, two year old, two years old or something, you know, the usual GP checkup and she was doing the full exam she's a wonderful GP and and she's like okay now I need to have a look at your wee wee or something like that and my son looked at me like terrified like what is happening I said don't worry she's gonna check your penis and your testicles and your scrotum right and he's like oh okay that's cool (laughs) right (laughs) because and then um yeah so that was um really interesting to me because and then then I thought afterwards probably if she used that language which is common in my household with other children they'd be terrified because they would have never heard those words before right so I think she was trying to use the appropriate language for the majority of uh, patients that she has in her practice right so I think um, it was really interesting to to both of us because we looked at our each other and she of course knows what I do and she's like of course right yeah Um, well if I can Claudia just sort of take an extension of that into adult males Uh, I mean, one of the um, stereotypic fears that I often hear is among males before a vasectomy and having this belief that, you know, that that was the equivalent of, quote, castration, right, that they would have their testicles removed. And so, again, it sort of harkens back to our lack of information on anatomy of exactly what happens during these procedures um, that follows people into into adulthood. So, yeah, we really need to at, at all levels need to be using accurate terms. So, Laurie, um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think terminology, words matter, right, as we know, and accurate words matter and um, and they are empowering in, in many ways. Mm-hmm. Um, you do a lot of research in this field. So tell us about your your research, your work life. Like, um, really curious to hear more. Yeah. So a major uh, thread through my own research is um, developing treatments for people with sexual problems, and in particular, women with low desire, which um, when it is chronic and distressing, it can be diagnosed as sexual interest arousal disorder. But it's probably easier just for the purposes of this conversation to refer to it as low desire. And when we look at the causes of low desire, um, the, the major causes are not medical, physiological Uh, hormonal, although those factors can absolutely play a role, more often the causes have to do with stress, depression, anxiety, lack of communication, lack of information, lack of education. Um, And uh, so uh, a big focus of my own research has been on developing and then testing either mindfulness-based interventions, and mindfulness is a Um, millennia old practice that involves paying attention to the present moment on purpose. Um, But we sort of secularized it and, and packaged it in bite sized skills that people can practice in the here and now. And then also developing and testing purely psychoeducational based. So what happens when we provide people just with good, accurate information? Um, We did this for years and years in a group format. So we would bring women together around the table, present information, give them opportunities to support one another and ask questions and validate one another. Uh, And then we tested all sorts of outcomes, including sexual desire and sexual distress and uh, rumination. And we would follow people for up to a year. And it turns out that, yes, as we predicted, mindfulness is really powerful for improving desire and reducing distress, but pure psychoeducation alone is also extremely powerful. Um, We found pretty significant and meaningful improvements in uh, desire and distress 
again, purely from giving good information in a group format to people. And so for, for a lot of them, it was hearing it for the first time, not feeling broken, uh, having their inaccuracies and stereotypes challenged by good information, empowering them to talk to partners about their preferences and dislikes. Um, and that, uh, again, continued to benefit them for a year later. So that's been a major focus of my research. And then I have a number of offshoots of that research. So digital technology adaptations of these face-to-face -face groups, because, of course, access is a big barrier to a lot of people, geographic access, um, mobility-related access, um, ethno-cultural-related barriers. Um, and so over the last three years or so, coincidentally, it, it happened at the same time of the pandemic, but we started to ask these questions pre-pandemic, but certainly the pandemic just sped up our work in that area of validating these tools um, in, in online digital health formats. Thanks, Laurie. That sounds super interesting. And uh... I'm so grateful that you're doing some great work. Um, um, and, and I'm wondering to bring this back to the anatomy. I remember earlier in our conversation today, you were saying that there's no anato anatomical G spot, you know? Um, I'm wondering, is there a neurological G spot? Is there like a brain center for, for pleasure? Um, have you come across anything like that in your research? Yeah, it's uh, it's a good question and certainly a topic area that uh, brain Im imagers and neuroscientists have been very interested in, in particular with with um, female bodied people, because measuring the body's response doesn't tell you a whole lot about how that person is feeling in their mind. And um, those studies have been done many, many, many times. In fact, I also have a sexual psychophysiology lab uh, just down the hall here where you know, we, we bring participants in, expose them to erotic films, measure their physiological response, essentially um, uh, the amount of uh, va uh, vaginal vasal congestion or blood pooling. Then we ask, we ask them to rate using a handheld lever, how sexually excited they are in their mind. And there's no agreement between the extent of physiological excitement and self-reported. So there's been a lot done to study where is pleasure in the body. Um, and comparably less has been done to really pinpoint where does pleasure occur in the mind, mostly because we still don't know what we mean when we say pleasure. It's so subjective, right? Just like pain is like when someone says they're in pain, one person's pain, there's pain intensity, but then there's also the qualities of the pain that can really differ person to person. So what we do have is a number of studies that have attempted to map out where desire might be, where desire might originate and the parts of the brain that light up when a person says they're experiencing sexual desire. Um, but the question of are those the same as the pleasure centers? We don't know. We really don't know. Well, it's interesting because there's so much we really don't know. I remember mm -hmm. having to write a chapter about um, sort of the neuroanatomy of sex. It was part of a chapter. And male is pretty well described, right? Er erection, mm -hmm. ejaculation, the pathways mm -hmm. that sort of are behind that, uh, the... Um, interplay between the autonomic and the somatic nervous systems it's the pathways are there and I was reading I was writing and I was like well I'm not going to fall into the same um, sort of fallacy as all the books and everything I'm reading and ignore the female part right so I'm going to write an equal amount of text about female orgasm <laughs> Mm -hmm. I couldn't find anything yeah there was nothing there except convoluted papers that can be summarized as it's complicated. Right. And I was like, how do I bring this to an undergrad level that it's accessible and understandable without too much jargon? You know, like, how can I make a diagram like I can make relatively easily for what we understand about male erection and ejaculation and orgasm? Mm -hmm. it, it's not that simple. Right. And, um, and there's, at least when I was writing this 10 years ago, there was no literature explaining it. Um, I don't know, what what have you found? I, I mean, I completely agree with you and it has extended through all, 
all facets of sexuality, including right through to treatment, where, you know, as I talked about, my interest has been on more psychological and educational treatments, but in the domain of, of medications, um, we do have two approved medications to address low desire in women. They were just approved two years ago, and both of them work marginally better than a placebo. And this is despite millions and millions of dollars from pharmaceutical companies that have gone into finding the, quote, female Viagra. So, um, you know, is, is it because women's sexuality is more complex? Is it because there are more interpersonal and social and social determinant components of it? I, I do not want to diminish male and men's sexuality in a reductionistic way to being purely about, you know, erection in the penis. That's not the case. But it is the case that women's sexuality is is pretty complex in ways that we just have yet to understand. Laurie, I have a something that just came into my mind here, and that is, are we boxing things a little bit too much, right? Mm -hmm. So for males, it seems easy to just look at erection ejaculation because we can see it. And maybe we're disregarding a whole sort of world of pleasure that men don't have access to either because they and we as a society, everybody just focuses on erection and ejaculation. So I wonder if there's, if we're missing a lot there. And that sort of leads me into um, the fact that not all of us are binary. So we're talking about it on a binary, like right. male, female, but there's so much in between. And yeah. there's so many experiences that won't be boxed in. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Like, how does mm -hmm. uh, the binary of our society influence the pleasure in our society? Right. Well, I think it's it's constraining, right? So on a purely scientific level, looking at things through the lens of sex, i.e. male, female, or binary gender, man, woman, ignores uh, the experiences of a significant proportion of our society that we could probably learn a lot about because um, for, uh, for, and here's where some really good social science and qualitative research has looked at the experiences of sexuality and pleasure among people who don't fit neatly into those binary boxes. Um, and so what can we learn from those experiences that might benefit all humans? Um, there are probably more within gender and within sex differences than between gender and between sex differences. So to your first question about the harms of boxing people into kind of a two by two table um, is are, are, are quite significant. Um, and we need to kind of take each one of those cells and stretch them way out and take a look at the, the nuance um, uh, among people. And part of that is going to be a real culture shift in how we do science as well. I think it's long overdue. Um, we are we now have access to much better ways of asking about sex and gender. Um, and it's no longer okay to publish papers that exclude those sex and gender minorities um, and similarly funding agencies are saying it's not enough. It's not okay to say we didn't have enough of a sample size of uh, non-binary asexual people to include them in our paper um, because that's the only way we're going to start to build some knowledge uh, around that. So I would just implore students who might be listening to this who are interested in doing um, sex research or really any research for that matter to be inclusive in, in uh, who they recruit, how they recruit and how they ask about sex and gender. And there are some really excellent guides uh, to help us to do that in a better way. Thanks so much, Laurie. And this has been excellent talking to you. And I kind of, I think it just segues very well into um, the uh, biomedical visualization course. Uh, in terms of uh, messaging, you know, because a, a large part of what our students are, are learning about is how to accurately message anatomy uh, and science uh, to, to different kinds of audiences. And, and so maybe the last word I want to leave to you is about communication, you know, to say, um, what can our students learn uh, about communicating sex and gender and uh, the, uh, the anatomy 
um, of sex better? And, and what what's the takeaway message you might like them to have about how to uh, better message um, in a in a healthy way that that does not discountenance that is not exclusive but inclusive and and Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any thoughts about that oh goodness i mean i have been so impressed with um tiktok videos on this i have to say and i'm and i'm glad that i'm fully tenured uh that i can sort of you know take risks and put myself on tiktok and social media or you know netflix in these ways and not worry about repercussions which is kind of silly in and of itself when you think about it but um there are so many influential sex educators on social media and tiktok in particular that are championing this message around you know, the power of communication in changing how we think and changing a culture that has denigrated sexuality and pathologized sexuality. And I truly think that um, youth and young people are in the best position because they're far more influential than I am. I mean, I can do the research and get the grant money and discover these findings. But if I can't speak to and convince the audiences you know, then I sort of say, what's the point in, in doing this work? So, you know, for the for the people listening in in the class, um, you know, really using their own voice and their own platforms to shape uh, what we know to direct people who might have had absent or negative sex education, like we all have to some degree uh, towards good information to even speak up when someone uses a derogatory uh, term referring to genital anatomy and saying, oh, um, do you mean the labia minora? Is that what you mean? <laughs> or what have you. And so, uh, and, and, and social media, again, can also be a great place to hop on and just share tidbits of good information. So maybe some of the students are listening to this podcast episode and hop on to social media and talk about one thing that they learned and then you sort of have this nice snowball trickle effect of information being shared with uh, much larger numbers of people. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about um, the, the power that young people have to reverse this, you know, decades old um, pathologizing of, of sexuality and bodies that we've seen. And it's time to turn it around. Thank you so much, Lori. I think these are the best ending words. It's time to turn it around. I think um, we're just going to leave it at that. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining us in this episode of Body Banter. Um, What a what a pleasure to have had you here with us. Thanks so much. And um, we look forward to our next episode. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of Body Banter. We are Claudia and Shegun, and we look forward to having you join us for more conversations about the human body next time.